Well, you went to Dickinson for a long time? Well, I came here to go to college. Oh, okay. And then, I was in trouble when I was going to go to the hospital. Oh, okay. When I got here, I was going to go to the hospital. Because I was going to go to the hospital. Sure. But my dad got me some jobs in New York City. And he and I would go to the George Washington Bridge every day.
attend that service. Tuesday evening session meets here at the church. There is no choir practice this week um, because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, please take note of the other events that are coming up. There is also a notice in your bulletin that next Sunday following worship there will be a congregational meeting for the purpose of electing officers and approving the pastor's terms of call. There are some other um, notices there in your bulletin as well. And I think we have a minute for mission today. Is that correct? Okay. Connie uh, Hustler is here with a minute for mission. Let us stand and worship God together. <clears throat> Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, O you who answers prayer. You crown the year with your bounty, your wagon tracks overflow with riches. The pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy. Meadows clothe themselves with the flocks, the valleys deck themselves with the rain, they shout and sing together for joy. We 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us draw near to God and pray. We thank you, O God, for the manifold gifts you have given to us, and yet we confess to you that we have often taken for granted your grace and your goodness toward us. We have delighted in the gifts rather than in the giver. We have praised ourselves for what we have accomplished rather than acknowledging that all good things come from Forgive us in your mercy, Lord, and grant that we might be truly grateful for all that you have given to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn only Christ? And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone then who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old life has gone. A new life is begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.
first lesson today is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 18. This can be found in the Old Testament, page 165 of the Bible. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid waste land with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from flint rock, and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end, to do you good. Do not save yourself. My power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this well. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to give wealth, so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors, as he is doing today. The word of the Lord.
I've been told that since the music is uh, not as much today that I get an extra 15 minutes of preaching. <laughs> I'm not prepared for that, but I'm willing to wing it. I'm just kidding. I would not do that to you. I wouldn't do it to myself. The second scripture lesson today is from the New Testament, from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, beginning at verse 6 and continuing through verse 15. <coughs> Listen again to God's word. The point is this, Paul writes, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing, and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Make us to know your ways, O God. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. And our hope is in you all day long. Here in the middle part of 2 Corinthians in chapters 8 and 9, Paul is making his appeal to the Corinthians, to the wealthy Corinthian believers. Your brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, he says, need your help. It's a bit like the PBS pledge drive or those incredibly sad commercials for the ASPCA or Jerry Lewis's Labor Day telethon, we need your help, they need your help. Paul's appeal goes to the Christians of Corinth on behalf of the saints in Jerusalem, the believers in Jerusalem. They are being persecuted, they are poor, they cannot afford to survive, they need help. Can you help them? What can you do out of your abundance to bless them? It may come as a surprise to some of the more staunchly Presbyterian among us, but God does indeed call us to lives of <coughs> joyful generosity. Our generosity is modeled on that of our Lord Jesus himself who though he had little, almost nothing in terms of earthly wealth, shared generously always with everyone who was in need, and then who gave of himself fully and completely on the cross so that we might be reconciled to God. When we are faced with the option of giving, when we are asked to give, 
we tend to ask the question, how much? How much do I have to give to get that tote bag from PBS or that t-shirt from the ASPCA or my name on TV? We ask, what's the, what's the least amount I have to give? But Jesus asks a different question. Jesus asks, how much can I give? How much can I give? Paul says his point is this, that the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's easy enough for us to understand. It makes sense. If you don't spread enough seed around, how can you expect it to grow? How can you expect to have a harvest? In the Gospels, Jesus tells a parable about a sower who goes out one day to sow seed. And the sower doesn't seem to be a professional. He doesn't even seem to know what he's doing because he just sows seed everywhere. He seems to just throw it around with great reckless abandon. As a result, Jesus says, some of the seed that gets sown falls on the path. And nothing really happens to it because the birds come quickly and they eat it right up. Some of the seed, though, falls on rocky ground. And that seed started to grow quickly because it was able to take root in the shallow soil. But because the soil is so thin, so shallow, the roots have nowhere to go, and the plants withered away in the heat of the day. Some of the seed, Jesus said, falls among thorns, but that seed was choked out as soon as it started to grow. And finally, some of the seed falls in good soil, where it grows and multiplies, and the harvest is abundant, Jesus said. Harvest is abundant. <clears throat> this is one of those rare parables that Jesus actually takes the time to explain it. It's not one of those parables that he just sort of smiles enigmatically and leaves it up to us to try to figure out what he's saying. Jesus actually explains what's going on in this parable. It's in Matthew 13, if you're interested. But the point is that the sower, when he goes out, spreads the seed around freely. He doesn't just sow in the fields. He spreads the seed everywhere in hopes, in hopes that some of it might grow. In other words, he sows abundantly so that in time he might also reap abundantly. Each of you must give, Paul says, as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly, or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver, Paul says. For Paul, giving is not optional. Giving is at the very heart of who we are as Christians. That's what Paul was saying. We are giving people. But what we do have in our control, Paul says, is our attitude when it comes to giving. What is your attitude in giving? Are you joyful or are you reluctant? Do you do it because you feel guilty or because you want to? Do you look at your checkbook balance and ask, what's the least amount I can give? Or do you look at it and ask, how much can I give? In the Gospels, there's another brief story. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and this is during Holy Week. Jesus has come into the Holy City, been welcomed, and things are starting to unravel. Jesus has been in the temple teaching and preaching, and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they've all been asking him questions. Questions about who he is, about what he is teaching, about what he believes. 
And at one point there in the midst of all the chaos and confusion, Jesus sees a woman, a poor woman, approach the treasury office in the temple, the place where you go to pay your treasury taxes, your temple taxes. Now there were lots of other people all around who had been going in and out from the temple treasury to pay their taxes, and some of the people who were coming in and out were actually incredibly wealthy. There were very, very wealthy men who had been making their contributions to the temple, and there was vast sums of money, bags and bags, filled with silver and with gold. But Jesus focuses on this one poor woman who approaches with just two, two small copper coins in her hand, and she places them in the box quietly, reverently. She walks away. Together, those two coins might be worth a dollar, two dollars at the most in today's money. So you couldn't buy much with those coins. They were practically worthless. And yet Jesus praises her. Jesus lifts her up as an example of generosity. Truly, he says, truly I tell you this poor widow has put in more than all of them, all of those rich guys, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Those rich guys, they could put in ten times that much and it wouldn't even hurt their bottom line. But this poor woman, she has given all that she has. And she's done it joyfully. Are you giving joyfully or are you giving reluctantly? What's the least I have to give or how much can I give? God abundantly blesses the givers, Paul says, providing them, providing us with enough, enough of everything so that we might share in his good work. Paul's words really strike me in this particular verse. Enough of everything. We will have enough of everything. We live today in a world where not very many people are satisfied with enough, right? We live in a world where we want more. We want faster cars and bigger TVs and newer clothes and too much food and the superlatives of everything. Having just enough today in this world looks an awful lot like poverty to a lot of people. And yet, having just enough is an idea that is deeply rooted in the Bible. Think about the Israelites when they finally escape from slavery in Egypt. God leads them out through the Red Sea and out into the wilderness. And at first, they're happy. Right? At first they are happy, they are so incredibly joyous to be free of the Egyptians, they're enslavers. But pretty soon they begin to complain. We're hungry, we're thirsty, let's go back to Egypt. And what happens? God provides for them, not too much, and not too little, but just enough. I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, God says. I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. This is the original daily bread. And so for the next 40 years, the Israelites gather manna, an omer per person per day. And it is enough, not too much, 
and not too little. It is enough. As faithful, cheerful givers, this is how God provides for us. Not too much and not too little, but just enough each and every day. Generosity, then, Paul says, enriches us in every way. <clears throat> Giving, you see, is not about us. It's not about getting our name on a plaque or our picture in the newspaper. Giving is not about us. Giving is about the glory of God. In giving, we receive a satisfaction that cannot be measured in material terms. Paul says you will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. You will be enriched in every way. I take that to mean that we will receive far more than we give. But it's not about money. It's about so much more than money. It's the goodness in seeing a family be able to celebrate Thanksgiving together. It's the happiness of a child receiving a gift at Christmas. It's the, the joy in, in going just down the street or halfway around the world to meet your neighbor and to learn from them how to better love and serve the world. Being enriched the way Paul writes about it isn't about having a, a fatter wallet or a, a larger bank balance. It's about having a, a bigger heart and ever-increasing compassion. We all have God-given resources in this life, and it's up to us to use those resources. It's up to us whether we will sow sparingly or bountifully, and how then we will harvest. Paul says that his request for the, for the wealthy Corinthians to support their poor brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, Paul says it's a testing, a testing that brings glory to God because of the believer's obedience to the gospel. The gospel that teaches us, that instills in us the, the joy of generosity. Christians are givers. The gospel reminds us that God in his great and generous love did not even spare his son in order to save us and redeem us, but gave him up. This is the model for our giving and our thanksgiving. It is joyful. It is sacrificial. It is complete. We offer our pledges to God today for the coming year, and in doing so, we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. As we do so, may we remember the way God loves us, and in turn, let us seek to be part of that love, sharing joyfully, abundantly, bountifully, enriched in every way, as we give thanks to God now and always. Our hymn, the second hymn is in the green book, number 216. And it's always a little confusing um, if you look at it. You sing through the first, second, and down into the third line. Then you go back to the beginning again. And then you sing down to the third line. Then you skip to the bottom line. Then you go up to the top. You come back to the this little line here and do this line. Go up to the top and then you sing here. So try to follow that. Um, hum along or don't sing or whatever. You want. <laughs> Jesus. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand Eternal God, as we pray this day, thank you seems not enough. As we gather here today, we are mindful of the blessings that we have received, mindful of the bounty of your hand. And we give thanks, O oh God, we give thanks for the ways in which you bless us, the ways that we recognize, O oh God, but also the ways in which we do not always see or understand. As we gather this day, O oh Lord, we are reminded that Thanksgiving is soon upon us. And that is a day we set it aside to return thanks to you but that as your children, we live with an attitude of thanksgiving and gratitude all year long for all your blessings, most especially, Lord, the blessing of life and redemption that we receive in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us to cultivate our attitudes of joy and thanksgiving and generosity that we may live as your faithful people that we may seek in our own lives to share our blessings <clears throat> that we might share what we have received with those who are in need help us O oh lord to be the cheerful givers <coughs> that you love to give not under compulsion or reluctantly, but to give for the love of giving and for the love of being able to give and to help and to share your love. Lord, as we gather this day, we bring our pledges for the coming year. And we pray, O oh Lord, that those pledges would be dedicated to you to your work in this place and to the strengthening of this part of your body, the body of Christ, that we might continue to bear witness to the gospel, that we might continue to share the love of Jesus Christ, that we might be able to reach out to those who are struggling, 
to those who are fearful, those who are afraid and lonely, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we gather this day, we come with prayers, many, many prayers. We pray for peace in this war-torn world in which we live, O oh God. We pray for peace in Ukraine and peace in the Middle East. We pray for an end to the fighting, that all sides would put down their weapons and value life, the gift of life that you give to us. Lord, we pray for peace. Peace that is beyond our ability to understand or comprehend because as we look at things now, it does not look peaceful. But we know, O oh Lord, and we trust, O oh Lord, that you see a way forward, that you see a way towards peace. Lord, as we gather this day, we lift up our prayers for our congregation and our community and our nation. We pray for all those who need your healing touch, O oh God, in mind or body or spirit. We remember especially today Art and Helen. Lord, be with them. Grant them your healing. Lord, for all of our other prayers, for all that is on our hearts and in our minds, for all that worries us, for all that gives us great and lasting joy, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in the name of our Lord Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. We have the opportunity to give back to God a portion of what God has given to us. In this life, the offering plates remain at the doors and the exits. A reminder that the blue envelopes in your bulletin this morning are for the thank offering, for your use, and also that pledge cards can be placed in the offering plates today. If you need an extra pledge card, there are extras on some of the windowsills and in Fellowship Hall as well. Thank you for your goodness and your generosity. And we will now sing the doxology.
church. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now. Remain with you always. Amen.